Thank you so much, Judge, for having us and for hosting us. We're so grateful to be here at Emory um, and so grateful to the folks that made a this evening's event possible. Um, thank you so much. And thanks to each of you for joining us tonight. Um, what a great way to spend your Tuesday night here talking about Georgia and where it fits in with the movement um, to uh, the movement on the death penalty overall. So many of us, uh, I, I imagine that a number of us in this room are here because of the case of Troy Davis. Um, Troy Davis's case brought the eyes of the world on Georgia over the last few years, ultimately culminating in the night of his execution last September. Um, Troy Davis was executed despite numerous, uh, numerous problems with his cases, most significantly the fact that he was convicted on the basis of only eyewitness testimony um, and seven out of nine eyewitnesses that originally contributed to his conviction uh, changed or recanted that testimony. Um, people around the world were watching Georgia that night in September when the execution went forward. But this was not the first time that the eyes of the world have been on Georgia with regard to our death penalty, and that's why we're here tonight. We're here to revisit a couple de decisions and look at where we stand today in light of them. This year marks 40 years since the decision of Gregg versus Georgia, a decision out of the United States Supreme Court, which uh, happened in 1972, had nine separate opinions and a five to four vote that found that Georgia's death penalty statute was arbitrary and capricious. Those are the two words you need to remember when you think about, about Furman versus Georgia, arbitrary and capricious. With the Furman decision, the Supreme Court set the standard that a punishment would be deemed cruel and unusual if it was too severe for the crime, if it was arbitrary, which it was in Georgia because it gave the jury complete sentencing discretion if it offended society's sense of justice, or if it was not more effective than a less severe penalty. Justice Potter Stewart, who wrote um, for one of, as one of the majority, uh, wrote that these sentences are cruel and unusual in the same way that being struck by lightning is cruel and unusual. He went on to discuss the, arbitrary of, uh, the, uh, the arbitrariness of the application of the death penalty and wrote that I simply conclude that the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments cannot tolerate the infliction of a sentence of death under legal systems that permit this unique penalty to be so wantonly and so freakishly imposed. So great, right? The Supreme Court voids 40 death penalty statutes across the country commutes the sentences of 629 death row, folks who are on death row, and it effectively suspends the death penalty because the existing statutes that governed it were no longer valid. But so what happens after that? Um, the states across the country take a cue that their death penalty statute, since it no longer exists, needs to be written, rewritten. And uh, they start rewriting their decisions, specifically looking to eliminate the problems that were cited in Furman. Just, uh, and so some of the, some of the facets of the, the new statutes uh, included things like uh, sentencing guidelines that would be provided for the judge and the jury when they're decided, deciding whether or not to impose death. Uh, these new statutes also included uh, the, uh, the ability to introduce uh, evidence of aggravating and mitigating factors uh, in determining sentencing. Just a mere four years after the Furman decision, all these new statutes were upheld by the United States Supreme Court in a case called Gregg versus Georgia. The two words to remember for Gregg are aggravating and mitigating because it was through, uh, through examining the new statutes and the ability to present the aggravating and mitigating factors that uh, the United States Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty. Um, it, originally under Gregg in three states, it was three cases that came up from Florida, Georgia, and Texas, found them to be constitutional. And uh, the court itself held that the death penalty itself was constitutional under the Eighth Amendment. So, here we are, um, 2012, and uh, you know, our U.S. Supreme Court said that the death penalty is just fine and it's constitutional under the Eighth Amendment, yet we know that there are still so many problems that persist. We know that there are problems with race. We know there are problems on the kind of justice you get based on where you live. We know there are problems with uh, whether you come to a, to a capital trial if you are a person who lives in poverty. And so we're here to look at those, at exactly how those, those facets come together in the way that the death penalty is carried out today. I'm so excited to introduce this incredible panel 
Um, we really are lucky to have some of the some of the top minds on the death penalty to be here with us tonight, and we're going to get it started. Um, we will do we'll allow for up, we'll say uh, we'll say up to 15 minutes of testimony because we definitely want to get to the point where y'all can participate. And I would encourage you all, as you're listening to the panelists, to jot down questions, take notes, um, and let's prepare to have an, an invigorated conversation um, upon completion of the panel. So we're going to start um, by bringing up Dr. Sarah Bacon. Uh, Dr. Bacon is a criminologist who has over 10 years experience studying the administrative administration of the capital punishment in the United States. She was the project director for the Maryland Study on Capital Punishment, which was a comprehensive examination of the administrative of the administration of the death penalty with respect to race and geography from 1978 through 1999. Dr. Bacon is also particularly interested in research design and quantitative methods to assess the deterrent effects of capital punishment on violent crime. She's the author of several papers on capital punishment and co-authored The Death Penalty, America's Experience with Capital Punishment with Ray Paternoster and Bobby Brame. Let's welcome up Dr. Bacon. Good evening. It's quite loud. Thanks, everyone, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I really enjoy thinking and talking about the death penalty, which is one of a number of things that makes me kind of odd. But um, this is actually a fun evening for me. I saw some eyes glaze over and some looks of panic when Sarah mentioned that I um, enjoy research design and quantitative methods. I promise that will play very little role in what I have to say to you this evening, but bear with me for those moments that do allude to that. Um, I want to start by telling you that I'm not a lawyer. Um, I feel a bit out of my element. Can I, if you'll indulge me, can I just get a sense of, of who's here? How many of you are um, law students here or elsewhere? Oh, good, lots of you. And how many of you are graduates of this or other law schools? and other just death penalty interested parties. Excellent, all right, thank you. Um, so like I said, I love um, thinking and talking about the death penalty. I don't do so from the perspective of, of a lawyer or an attorney. I don't speak legalese. I didn't go to law school. That would have been a disaster. Um, I'm a criminologist by training and a social scientist in my current work. Um, so I think about the death penalty and capital punishment in terms of an institution of our society. And in particular, I'm interested in the application of this institution and, and the consequences of how we apply capital punishment. Um, there's tons of different ways to think about the death penalty, and I, I used to teach a class on this to um, both undergrads and grad students. And I loved it because everyone brought something to the room. A lot of you have thought about the death penalty probably more than the average person, but everyone, regardless of whether you've ever engaged in any sort of purposeful exploration, everyone has an opinion about the death penalty, um, sometimes better informed than others. But it makes for great invigorating conversation, so I too look forward to that, that portion of, of our evening. But you can think about the death penalty from so many different aspects or facets. You can think about the cost of the death penalty. You can ask whether the death penalty deters violent crime or homicide in particular. You can look at um, the question of innocence, which has been um, something more recently and sustainably on the national consciousness. Um, you can look at methods of execution. You can talk about botched executions and, and on and on and on. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues for us to really explore and, and further our thinking about capital punishment. But for me, I organize my thinking around two particular questions. And so every conversation I have and every sort of, every time I'm assessing where I stand, I do so from the perspective of these two questions that I want to tell you about. The first essential question for me to organize my thinking is, is death an appropriate response to some crimes. So sort of at the individual level, are some crimes so heinous and so atrocious and so harmful to the fabric of our societies that death is a warranted response to them? And for me, personally, my answer to that question is yes. And I still surprise myself sometimes when I say that, because I didn't always feel that way. Um, but my first three years in graduate school, 
I spent the, I feel what felt like the entire three years driving around the state to every police station, courthouse, prison in the state um, as part of the research that I want to tell you about. And um, along with a team of researchers, I examined every single homicide in the state of Maryland from 1978 through the end of 1999. So I personally looked at 6,000 homicides. And of those 6,000 homicides, we had to look at court transcripts, of course, police reports, homic supplemental homicide reports. But we also had to look at crime scene photos, and we had to look at autopsy photos, and we had to listen to 911 tapes, and we had to read victim impact statements. And after those three years and those 6,000 cases, I was unequivocally left with the impression that there are certain things that one human being can do to another that make me really okay with them no longer existing. I saw enough cases where I really felt like that person had forfeited their right to live among us, which was a really surprising place for me to arrive because that was not where I started. So for me, my answer to that question, is death an appropriate response to some crimes, is absolutely yes. Um, and I find that in general, people tend to answer that question from a very personal place. You can engage in you know, great discussions of Kantian retribution and utilitarian approaches to punishment and you know, all of these sort of grander scheme, um, philosophical and sociological and, and legal perspectives. But ultimately, I think for most people, they answer that question more from a gut place, more from a personal place. And I think that's totally OK, um, because I think that's only part of the picture. The second question that we need to think really, really carefully about, and I think the question that brought us here this evening is this, is our system of justice capable of deciding in a fair and consistent manner who deserves to die and who doesn't? Is our system capable of discerning those cases in a fair and consistent manner which individuals have forfeited their right to live and which have not? So I want to use the rest of my time to tell you a little bit more about that research because it informs that question and leads me to another unequivocal response. Um, in January of 2004, when our research was initially released, Maryland's death row was 67% Afri African American and 92% of the people on Maryland's death row had killed a white victim. That is not unusual. That mirrored the national situation, and that's a fairly consistent pattern of what we observe in death rows across the country. Now, it's theoretically possible that those individuals on death row had committed the worst of the worst, that that was an accurate representation of the most heinous homicides, and that that was the correct group of people. If, if you believe in putting people on death row, that that was the right group of people to put on death row. But that's not an entirely plausible scenario based on um, demographics and common sense. It's not entirely likely that that's just how things ended up. Um, but it turns out that's an empirical question. That's a question that we can answer with data. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, so going back to when we started the study, it was around 2000. And the national conversation was really heated at that point, particularly around the issue of innocence. Some of you probably remember when Governor Ryan cleared um, all of death row in Illinois commuted many hundreds of sentences. Um, the Innocence Project was in full swing. And, and capital punishment in general was more on people's minds than it had been for quite some time. And so the governor of Maryland, Paris Glendening at the time, said to Ray Paternoster, who was my mentor, we got to figure this out. And he wasn't asking about innocence. He said, I want to know the answer to one thing. Does race matter? In our state, in the application of capital punishment, does race matter? Does it play a role? And so we set out to answer that question empirically. Um, and I'm going to try to relatively quickly walk through our process for doing that, but I really want to focus on what we found. Um, the, where we started was with the recognition that a death sentence is the culmination of several decision points. Frequently you hear about that sort of grand moment in a courtroom when a, a judge or a jury imposes a sentence of death. But that's really the last point um, in several sequential decision points that need to be assessed for where race enters into this decision-making process. So we looked at four time points. And again, this was for every single homicide in the state of Maryland from 1978, which, is, which was when post-Greg v. Georgia um, capital sentencing resumed in Maryland through the end of 1999. 
The first decision that's important is the state's attorney, or in some states, the district attorney, but um, in Maryland, the state's attorney's decision to seek the death penalty. The second is the state's, attorney, state's attorney's decision to retain the death penalty after all of the kind of pretrial proceedings. Third, upon conviction, the state's attorney has to decide um, to advance the case to a penalty trial. And notice I've already talked about um, three decision points, and I'm talking a lot about state's attorney decisions so far. And fourth, the judge or jury, and usually now the jury, um, imposes a sentence of death. So for each of those independent decision points, we need to understand independently at each, does race play a role? Um, so to look at that, we began with those 6,000 homicides, and we reviewed everything we could possibly think of about those 6,000 homicides. Of those, we identified 1,311, so just over 1,300 cases that were eligible, according to Maryland statute, to be pursued for the death penalty. So states where the state's cases where the state's attorney could have opted to move forward with a, a death notice. Of those roughly 1,300 cases, state's attorneys actually filed formal notice to pursue the death penalty in about 353. Of those, 140 were subsequently withdrawn. So we're left with 213 cases where the death notice stuck, is what we call it. Out of those 213 cases, 180 advanced to the penalty phase, wherein a death sentence could have been implemented. Um, so an important point emerges here. Out of what began as over 6,000 cases, 6,000 first and second degree homicides, only 3% of those progressed to a point in the system where a judge or a jury could have imposed a sentence of death. So research on the extent to which race matters that focuses solely on that decision point is important, and I don't want to undermine it, but I also want to highlight that it's one small piece of the process. It's one small piece of assessing where race becomes a factor. Um, and recall that we started with 1,300 cases that could have been pursued as death-eligible cases. So out of those, fewer than 14% um, actually um, arrived at a, a sentence of death, ultimately. So there you just have a descriptive sort of decision tree, and the next step then is to determine the extent to which race played a role in that funneling from 6,000 to 1,300 to 180 and so on. Um, so to do that, we have to look at every single factor that could possibly explain these outcomes because there are any number of relevant, appropriate considerations that might actually, and that should, and do, inform the selection of those cases and that narrowing. So we looked at everything we could possibly think of that could inform the journey, excuse me, um, to a death sentence. We looked at criminal history of the offender. We looked at the employment history of the offender, the education of the offender, the um, upbringing of the offender, the substance abuse history, the child maltreatment history, um, any character witnesses on behalf of the offender, anything that could have been raised as a mitigating factor in the penalty phase um, portion of capital sentencing. We looked at all that same information for the victim. We looked at the strength of the evidence. Certainly you can know someone's guilty, but until you can prove it, it doesn't do you much good, right? So we looked at eyewitness testimony. We looked at physical evidence. We looked at circumstantial evidence, everything that could influence a decision based on the strength of the evidence. And of course, we looked at the severity of the crime, which ultimately is what these decision, decisions should be based on. So we got into some really morbid detail about um, number of stab wounds, how long it took someone to die, whether there was torture involved in the offense, whether the victim was a, a particularly vulnerable individual, whether it was a child or someone with some sort of disability, everything we could possibly think of. And we controlled for all those. So now I'm going to get to the punchline because I'm probably getting close to running out of time. Let me tell you what we found. To begin, um, there is no evidence, based on our study in Maryland, there is no evidence that race of the defendant matters at any of those four decision points. People get this wrong a lot, so let me just say that again. There was no evidence in our study that the race of the defendant on its own mattered in any of those four decision points. Not so when we look at the victim's race. 
Um, even after every case characteristic was controlled, those who kill whites are significantly more likely to have the state's attorney file a death notice than those who kill non-whites. So that's that first stage, that first step of that four-step um, decision process. That race of victim effect persists across the four time points. It's not exaggerated, it's not exacerbated. We don't see it um, repeated, but we don't see it corrected either. So we ultimately see it in terms of the outcomes. Um, now when we look at the dyad of the race of the defendant and the race of the victim, now is where we start to see some additional interaction effects. A black, black offender who kills a white victim in our study was three to four times more likely to receive the death penalty than any other racial combination that we observed in our data. Three to, five, three to four times more likely. Race matters. These are current data. These are not data from pre Furman. These are not data even from immediately post Greg. These are recent current data. So what I want to leave you with is this. Race matters. Race plays a role in the capital sentencing process. The results of our study were um, depressingly consistent with the, race of, uh, with the findings of other studies. GAO has reviewed, I think, 28 studies and found consistent race of victim effects in particular across the board. Race matters. And so for me, based on that, my answer to that second question, is our system of justice able to discern which people should live and which people should die in a fair and consistent manner? My answer to that, unequivocally, no. Thank you, Dr. Bacon. Next, we want to provide a very personal experience of the death penalty um, uh, by bringing up Anthony Graves. I want to give you a little bit of background so you know who Anthony Graves is and why we're so glad to have him here with us today. Anthony Graves was released from a Texas prison on October 27, 2010, after being sent to death row 18 years previously. Graves was convicted in 1994 of assisting Robert Carter in multiple murders in 1992. There was no physical evidence linking Graves to the crime, and his conviction relied primarily on Carter's testimony that Graves was his accomplice. Two weeks before Carter was scheduled to be executed in 2000, he provided a statement saying he had lied about Graves' involvement in the crime. He repeated that statement just minutes before his execution. In 2006, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit overturned Mr. Graves' conviction and ordered a new trial after finding that prosecutors elicited false statements and withheld testimony that could have influenced the jurors. After District Attorney Parham began to reassemble the case and review the evidence, he hired former Harris County D Assistant District Attorney Kelly Siegler as a special prosecutor. Siegler soon realized that making the case against Mr. Graves would be impossible. Uh, Siegler said, after months of investigation and talking to every witness who's ever been involved in this case and people who've never been talked to before, after looking under every rock we could find, we found not one piece of credible evidence that links Anthony Graves to the commission of capital murder. This is not a case where the evidence went south with time or witnesses passed away or we just couldn't make the case anymore. He is an innocent man, said the district attorney. We are very pleased to have this innocent man with us here today. Let's welcome Anthony Graves. Wow, thank you. Good evening. I'm Anthony Graves. <laughs> uh, I was listening to the panelists everything they were saying, and I agree wholeheartedly, particularly about the race issue and all that. Uh, Non-whites versus whites that are murdered. The numbers are staggering as to, as to who's on death row behind it. Uh, I came in touch with the death penalty back in 1992. I, I didn't know anything about the death penalty until a knock came on my door one Sunday morning. My neighbor had knocked on the door to tell me that the police were looking for me. And I didn't know why. I asked him, you know, why would they be looking for me? He said, I don't know, man, but uh, they asked me, was that your vehicle out there? So, you know, I, I get up. I'm curious. 
And I go downstairs, I go look, I go looking for the police. I can tell you one thing, don't ever go looking for the police. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's kind of funny, but I say that to make a point. Because I went downstairs looking for the police to find out why they were looking for me. And it took me 18 years and two execution dates to come back home, okay? So that's why I said don't ever go look for the police. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, when they knocked on my door, and like I said, I didn't know what, what, what the police were looking at me for, and I go down there and I asked, and he takes me downtown to tell me that the officers want to talk to me, and I get there, and I'm sitting there, and nobody's talking to me, and I'm asking every officer that comes, you know, why am I here? Because somebody tell me something. And they kept telling me to hold on, wait, some officers are gonna come talk to you. About 20 minutes later, there were four Texas Rangers and a magistrate come in. Now at this point, the only people I've seen involved are white people. The Rangers, the magistrate, the person that came and arrested me, all white people. We're talking about race, so I'm going to be, I'm going to keep it real, okay? They were all white. And uh, they asked me to stand up. And I'm not thinking about nothing. I'm thinking, well, maybe I might have a ticket that I forgot about. I don't know, you know? But I got plans tonight, so let's get this moving forward, right? And uh, so they start reading me my rights. You know, you have a right to remain silent. You know, anything you can say will be used against you in court. And I'm just listening to them with nothing on my mind. And then they say, you've been charged with capital murder. Me? I've been, are you sure? My, somebody said I was involved in the crime? You know, this is my response. You sure you got the name right? That's no way, in, that's no way you can make this type of mistake. And they was like, yeah, well, do you want to go back and talk to us? I said, yes, sir. I, yeah, I want to talk to you. I don't have nothing to hide. So I go back and I talk to them. And it was, when I got back there, it was still four Texas Rangers white, but then this black Texas Ranger come in. And they say, well, they, they, they interrogate me, interrogate me, and I'm telling them that I don't know anything about this crime, and whoever said this about me, are you sure they said my name, blah, blah, blah. And they say, well, it's the race. Would you like for us to leave so you can talk to the black ranger? I said, I, nobody has to leave. I can tell you the same thing I'm telling him. I don't know anything about this crime. They said, well, we're going to leave and just let you talk to the black ranger. So they leave, and I stand with the black ranger. And we're talking. And, you know, I'm thinking that, okay, this guy, he wants to know the truth because surely he's not willing to just go along with convicting anyone. He knows how it is. So I'm telling this guy, hey, man, I don't know anything about this. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, you're in trouble, blah, blah, blah. I'm crying because I'm upset because nobody's listening to me. I'm trying to tell you I don't know anything about this case. Well, to make a long story short, I ended up going to jail for two, almost two and a half years before my trial. Why so long? What you gonna take me to trial on? That's not a shred of evidence that I had anything to do with this case. This case happened in another town. People came to my, my trial and testified to seeing me at the Jack in the Box the night before because she served me. It didn't make no difference. You know why? Because I had 11 white jurors and one, one guy that looked black. <laughs> and I was convicted with no evidence. My attorney, when I get to trial after two and a half years, I'm happy because, see, I'm naive at this stage. I think you go in there with the truth on your side, you come out victorious. That's how naive I was about our system. That's not the way our system works. So when you go in there, everybody's trying to win. Okay? And, the, and, the, and the playing field is not level because I didn't have no money. Okay? I couldn't afford to go in there 
and represent myself with the resources that the state had to try to convict me. I had nothing. All I had was the truth on my side. But it wasn't in dollars and cents. So I was convicted. But let me digress, because I want to tell you about Vordar. When we get to the trial, you go through Vordar. And I'm, I'm sitting in here, and I'm listening to all these potential jurors take the witness stand. And my attorneys asked them, each one of these. Now, let me just say, it was about 92 to 93 percent of the potential jurors white. And every time they would get up there, and my attorney said, well, what do you think about Mr. Gray sitting in here today? And most of them said, well, he had to have done something, otherwise you wouldn't have him here. And then they say, well, but can you follow the law? Now, if you're a law-abiding citizen, of course you're going to say you can follow the law. So those jurors said, well, yes, I can follow the law. They became rehabilitated jurors, and they sit on in the jury box judging me, and we already heard what they said. So I ended up with 11 white jurors, and like I said, a guy that looked at black. And my attorney, at the, they went into the room to pick their uh, foreman of the juror. And my attorney says to me, he says, well, I'm going to go back here and uh, see who did they pick as the foreman of the jury. And I said, it's going to be the black guy. And he looked at me. He said, why you say that? I just, I said, it's going to be the black guy. And then he went back there. And five minutes later, he come back with this perplexed look on his face. And I, I couldn't even believe why he, his, his look was so perplexed. He's black. He should have known what I was saying. And he came back to me and he said, the black guy is the foreman. How did you know that? I said, man, <laughs> because they're going to convict me before they even hear the case. And they put this black guy in the front to say he's the face of the jury. This black guy is going to be my worst critic because he can't be the only one that says not guilty. He don't realize he's following them, not leading. And he looked at me. And he said, well, I hope that the outcome doesn't come down to that. <laughs> I talked to a former Texas Ranger about two weeks ago. We've become really good friends because once he found out I was innocent, he, he tried to move heaven and earth to get me out of there. And he told me, he said, he said, Anthony, you know that black guy that was on the jury? You know how you were convicted? Because he told every other juror, well, if the Texas Rangers say he did it, then he must have did it. There's no evidence. But because the Texas Rangers testified falsely, this black man convinced the rest of them to convict me. So I was right. I knew this guy was going to be my worst critic. When he came back as the foreman of the jury, I knew I was going to be convicted. And the case had, the, the trial hadn't even started. So I was convicted after only, what, three days? It took two weeks to pick a jury and three days to have a trial. And I was convicted. Anyway, after I was convicted, you go to the second phase of the trial, which is, uh, you know, the penalty phase. And my attorney kept asking me, hey, do you know anyone that we can put up there, man, as character witnesses to help save your life? This is doing trial. And I said, no. He said, man, Mr. Graves, we need to save your life. He said, I believe in you, but the state will kill you. I said, no, man. I don't know nobody. He said, well, what about your family? I said, no, nah, I'm not putting my family up there. He said, why not? I said, because this is a joke, man. I'm not going to have my family be a part of this. But reluctantly, I agreed because they wanted to. And I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to my mother go up there, and she's telling this, this jury panel what kind of son I am and how I'm the glue of the family. And I listen to my sisters and them come up there. And then my son come up there. See, my son had sickle cell. 
And every time he would get sick, I would be there at the hospital with him, spend nights with him. He used to always have to have blood transfusions. So he's sitting up here in the witness stand, and he's begging these people not to kill his daddy. Because he said his daddy is his source of strength. Please don't kill my daddy. That fell on deaf ears because they had already made up their mind what they was going to do. And after my son cried and walked away, they went and deliberated for 30 minutes and gave me the death penalty. And I couldn't believe it. I just sat there. And the prosecutor kept jumping up. He said, Judge, I don't think Mr. Graves understand. Could you tell him again? I understood perfectly. But I was just, I mean, I was naive. I thought that I'm innocent. I'm going home. And then they tell me, I'm, no, I'm, you're going to death row. I didn't even know how to react to that. So I just sit there. And so the judge calls me up, me and my attorneys up to the, the judge bench, and he says, Mr. Graves, do you understand? And I just shook my head. And he said, well, I just want you to know that you've been found guilty, and the state has sentenced you to death, and you will die by lethal injection. You know, and I just, I shrugged my shoulders because I'm tired. You know, this is crazy. This is a nightmare. I was at home. A crime happened in another town. A man, this is how this man called my name. He was on the way to the DPS office with the officers. He seen a Jeep coming off the feet of the highway. He thought, it, he seen four black guys in it. He thought one was me. This is how he got my name. They investigated, went and found the guy that owned the Jeep. And the guy had record to show that he was at work in Houston. His Jeep was with him. I'd never even been in this guy's Jeep. They didn't care. They knew then he was lying, but they didn't care. But what I found out later on is that when he lied, immediately he recanted. See, she's saying about Henry Cannon right before, that was very true. But he recanted years before. The same night, they still arrested me. He recanted in front of the grand jury. He wrote any and everybody he could to tell them he lied throughout all the years I was incarcerated. Well, finally, we had a hearing, a deposition where the state would come down and my attorneys would come down and they would go in there and it's like a trial. And I, they're going back and forth, asking him questions. So finally that prosecutor started asking him. And the prosecutor, you know, he got this big booming voice and he's, he's trying to intimidate the guy, you know. And the guy says, I told you that man was innocent. You told me that's not what you wanted to hear. And he said, oh, I don't remember. The prosecutor said, I don't remember saying that. He said, yes, you do. He said, we was in the jail, and I told you that guy is innocent. I don't even know that guy. But you told me that you didn't want to hear that. And then you go out, and you charge my wife with capital murder. No evidence whatsoever on this woman. When the, when the attorney who represented her went and got her file to see what they had charged, what they had on her, they had one sheet of paper in her file with her name on it, nothing else. But they charged her with capital murder to make sure that he lied on me. And then after they convicted me, they dropped the charges against her. And this is a prosecutor who kind of like dominated these small rural towns for over 25 years. Every young black man from the age of 16 to 35 is either on parole, probation, or in prison in that community for little or nothing. So yeah, we definitely have a race issue. But it's not just about race in terms of skin color. I'm talking about e economics. If you're living in, on the other side of the tracks, your justice is different from the ones that live on this side of the tracks. I know. I went through it. We do not have a fair criminal justice system. And the reason why, now, it may be fair on the books, but if that man, that prosecutor that we have entrusted to uphold laws 
of breaking them, then what's on the book will not work. And because of that, I lost my life. So in 1994, I'm headed to death row. But something I don't even know anything about. And we're walking down here on death row, and I'm shackled, and all these people in the hallway, and they're telling them to get against the wall, turn their back, turn their head, don't look at me, because I was the next dead man walking. And then they took me down here to this wing called J-23. Now, J-23 was the wing where they put all the bad actors, people who did not want to follow the rules, who were breaking the laws. Down there, they put them on J-23, and they're taking me to J-23. I said, well, why? You just got there. Yeah, I hadn't done anything. I, I just got there. But they took me and put me on J-23 because they had nowhere else to put me. Death Row was overcrowded. We had over 500-some men on Texas Death Row when I got there. We were overcrowded, and the only place they could put me at was in the bad part of the neighborhood. And I stayed down there for 12 and a half years, and I watched over 300 executions. Guys that became family members to me, brothers. Guys who case had absolutely no evidence in them, and they were uh, shouting from the mountaintops about their innocence. They were murdered by the state of Texas. I can tell you that the state of Texas is executing innocent people, and whoever practiced the death penalty, if they haven't executed someone innocent, eventually they will. I know. I had two execution dates, but the state of Texas called me down to the office and told me that on August the 15th, the state of Texas is going to execute you, and they want to know what you want us to do with your body. August the 15th is my son's birthday. So I know we have a we have a big problem with this death penalty, and it can't be fixed. It can't be fixed because we are not going to stop making mistakes. That's why it cannot be fixed. And if we can't fix it, and if we're not sure that we're getting the right person, we cannot have the death penalty in our society. Well, as I say, I was on death row for 12 and a half years with two execution dates. Numerous guys around me being executed and murdered by the state of Texas. I seen guys go insane, just totally lose their mind, cut their throats, drop their appeals, not because of the case, but the conditions. The conditions is driving guys out of their minds. We're sitting in cells, and I say we because I still feel a part of that. I've only been out 15 months. But you sitting in a little old bitty 8 by 12 cell. No telephone, no television, nothing but four walls. And you're sitting out waiting to be executed day in and day out. You get out of your cell for one hour a day to walk around in a bigger cell until they put you back in. And you're just there. Imagine going into your restroom at home and getting locked in it. Nobody's there. Nobody can get you out. And you're there overnight. Times that by 365 times 12 and a half years. Okay, so anyway, I ended up, after 12 and a half years, the Fifth Circuit overturned my case. And October the 27th of 2010, I walked out of jail a free man for the first time in 18 years. And it shouldn't have been like that. So now what I do is I travel the country, I travel the world, and I speak about the death penalty. And I try to educate people as much as I can about this injustice, this cruel, inhumane punishment that we have in our system of justice. That's not justice. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Graves. We're so glad you could be with us today to tell your story. Um, before I bring up uh, Professor Lyons, I just want to uh, bring regrets from Senator Fort, who is tied up with business at the Capitol and will not be able to join us despite his, uh, his best efforts. Um, he asked me to share with you all a little bit about what he's doing this session with regard to the death penalty. Um, and for those of you who, who may not know Senator Fort, he's one of, um, one of our greatest allies uh, in, in fighting the death penalty at the Georgia General Assembly. His district is uh, in, it encompasses parts of Atlanta, parts of East Point, um, that part of the city. Um, he's been a leader in all sorts of civil rights issues from uh, predatory, banning predatory lenders to uh, racial profiling bills. Um, he's, he currently sits on the board of Georgians for all alternatives to the death penalty. And in response to the execution of Troy Davis, he has introduced legislation at Senate Bill 442 uh, that requires that there be physical evidence uh, present in order for district attorneys to seek the death penalty. Um, we've talked a little bit about the problems with eyewitness testimony. And what we know is that, uh, uh, that the most common factor in wrongful convictions is the presence of, of faulty eyewitness testimony. And so Senator Ford, in introducing this legislation, is trying to, to correct that. Um, and so he would ask for your support. Um, Next, I want to bring up um, an, incredible, uh, an incredible legal mind on the death penalty that we're delighted to have here from Chicago. Professor Andrea Lyon works to promote social justice, equity, and improvement in the criminal justice system. She's an attorney, an educator, and an author. At DePaul University College of Law, Professor Lyon serves as clinical professor of law, associate dean for clinical programs, and director for the Center for Justice in Capital Cases. Prior com to coming to DePaul, she founded the Illinois Capital Resource Center in 1990 and served as its director until joining the University of Michigan Law School faculty in 1995 as, a, as an assistant clinical professor. A winner of the prestigious National Legal Aid and Defender Association's Reginald Heber Smith Award for Best Advocate for the Poor in the Country, Professor Lyon is a nationally recognized expert in the field of the death penalty defense and a frequent continuing legal education teacher throughout the country. In 1998, she was awarded the Justice for All Award at the National Conference on Wrongful Convictions and the Death Penalty. In 2003, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Illinois Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. In 2005, she received the President's Commendation from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers for her death penalty work. She has defended over 30 potential capital cases at the trial level and has taken 19 through to, to the penalty phase at, and she won all 19, sorry. That's, it. That's important. She took 19 to trial, she won them all. She's the author of a book called Angel, on, Angel of Death Row, My Life as a Death Penalty Defense Lawyer. And we are delighted to have her with us today, Professor Lyon. So um, I'm going to talk about what to do about all this, okay, um, from a lawyer's perspective. I want to talk about, you know, we can talk about the problem of race, and it's important that we study it. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is sad that the, the issue that was identified here in Georgia uh, back in, in, in the 80s by uh, the now deceased Professor Baldus, that race of victim is the single most um, important factor as to whether someone gets the death penalty is still the case no matter where you go, no matter whether it's north, south, east, or west, it's still the most important factor. Have you ever had this experience where like you f realize something is true after you've spoken it? You ever, you know what I'm talking about? Like something comes out of your mouth and you go, yeah, that's right. So I, I do these um, things where I, I go and I talk to, to schools on career day. Do you guys remember career day? Remember that, you know, some old fart would come and talk to you about being whatever, a, you know, dentist or something like this. And now I'm, I'm the old fart. So I, anyway, this is when I was in the public defender's office and I went to go talk to this um, junior high school on the south side of Chicago that was all, uh, all black, all African American, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And um, I was a little bit more interesting than the dentist because I try murder cases, which is, you know, a little more interesting. And this one girl, little girl, asked me what I thought was a really interesting question. 
She said to me, Miss Lyon, when you get a new case, what's the first thing you want to know? And I said, before thinking about it, what color is the victim? And what broke my heart is I did not need to explain that to those children. They already knew that that was the most important thing. That's what broke my heart. One of the things you have to know when you try a death penalty case is that, that its purpose is not justice. Its purpose is not just desert. It's not trying to even out some karmic wrong. Its purpose is political. If you think it's not, take a look at how people run for judge in Alabama, for example, where the judge can override a jury. Did you know that half of the men on death row in Alabama got life from juries and judges overruled it and, and sentenced them to death so that they could run for election by saying, I kill people. I'm in favor of the death penalty. And if you, can't, if you don't know that, as, a, as an advocate for a client, then you're not doing a good job. Sometimes people say to me, you know, what's the first motion you file on a death penalty case? I'm like, motion to continue this to an uneven numbered year. Because I do not want to be the part of the prosecutor's re-election campaign, the judge's re-election campaign. I don't want anybody thinking about any of that when we are trying the case. Because if they are, then everything is going to go against us. Every motion is going to be denied. You know, I, I was recently involved in a case that got some publicity in Florida, and um, we lost 100% of our motions. I, just, I don't know, it seems to me odd that we were wrong that often. And so w one of the things when you're thinking about the issue of race and the death penalty that you have to think about, and I was really glad, Mr. Graves, that you brought up the issue about jury selection. Because this is one of the things that a lot of people don't realize in the general public. Your opinion about the death penalty is a reason to exclude you from jury service. Let me explain what I mean. There's, there's two kinds of strikes in a trial. One is called a, a, a strike for cause. Usually that means, um, you know, you know one of the police officers in the case, or you've been the victim of a similar kind of crime, or, or something like that, right? And so you can't be fair in this case for a specific personal reason. Um, and then there are what are called peremptory challenges, and each side gets a certain number of challenges where they can just exclude someone who's not excludable for cause, but that they think might not be fair to their client, or might not like their client. Um, but in a death penalty case, before a single witness has spoken, you get to find out whether or not the juror is in favor of the death penalty. Because if they're opposed to the death penalty, they fall into that cause category. That is, they're excluded for cause. And what that means is that, er, that, first of all, you're talking about the death penalty before there's ever been a trial. So people who think, you know, well, where there's smoke, there's fire, the, the, the Texas Rangers wouldn't arrest somebody who hadn't done it, well, you, you, you know, and, and you have that group of people, and anyone who's against the death penalty is excluded for cause, which is the judge gets communicated to the jury that, you know, the death penalty is the right thing, and plus we're talking about punishment before there's been a trial, so this whole trial thing is just a technicality. It's what the social scientists call the process effect. And here's what we also know a much larger proportion of African-American and Hispanic jurors and a very high proportion of Native American jurors don't support the death penalty. I mean, some do, of course, but a huge proportion do not. So, with your 93% white jury panel and the 7% of potential African-American jurors, you're going to lose most of them at the cause challenge because they hold this opinion. Now, there's no other opinion you can hold that would automatically exclude you from jury service, right? That is, if you were, um, say you're a tax protester, you don't like the IRS. I don't know too many people who do, but you're really a tax protester. You believe you should never file taxes, you're one of those people, and you get called to jury duty in a federal building in a tax evasion case, and you reveal to the judge that you're a tax protester you would not be automatically excluded from the jury if you could tell the judge, Look, yeah, I have this opinion, but I can ignore it and vote on the facts and the law that are before me 
um, and then you would not be excluded for cause. Now, the prosecution might use a peremptory challenge because maybe they would be worried about you, but you wouldn't be gone for cause. So what ends up happening? And this is one of the things that we litigate and that needs to be litigated and that needs to also be a part of a legislative push, in my view. Okay? And we need to give it a nice Republican name, like Juror's Bill of Rights or something. Okay? <laughs> uh, am, am I offending people out here? I, <laughs> um, well, you know, if, if you call it by what it really is, that never works. So they, they don't call anything by what it really is, you know. You know, pro-life, yeah, pro-life <laughs> locked up. Um, so, you know, uh, um, and, and so what ends up happening is that all the jurors who are against the death penalty are excluded for cause, all those who say, well, you know, I didn't have a problem with bin Laden getting killed or something, they get excluded, excluded peremptorily because the, the, the prosecution's worried that they're, you know, I don't know, human or something, right? And, and, you know, and then anyone who looks like my client is also gone, right? Because they can use their peremptory challenges. They're not supposed to be able to do that for racially based reasons under a case called Batson versus Kentucky. But all they have to do is make up something. You know, here are some racially neutral, neutral reasons that have been upheld by courts. You own a house, you rent a house. You're married, you're single. You have children, you don't have children. You went to college, you, d you get the point, right? Anything at all can be racially neutral. I don't like how he looked at me, is racially neutral. They upheld, really, I'm not kidding, we had one case where there, was a, there were two women jurors. Both were school teachers in the Chicago public schools. Both were married. Both owned their own homes. One had two children, one had three children. They were the same age. And I think they went to the same college or grad school. I can't remember which. One was black, one was white. The black one was excluded. And the reason given by the prosecutor, really I'm not making this up, is that her skirt seemed tight and he questioned her moral values. Really. I mean, you know, I, I, how he formed his lips to even say that is beyond me, okay? So, so when I'm talking about, like, things we can do as advocates, what I'm talking about is doing what I feel it is the job of a capital defender to do. People sometimes say, well, how do you see yourself? Are you a knight in shining armor? They know that I'm not that coordinated to be able to get on a horse or holding. Um, no. What I actually see myself as is I am the little boy in the emperor's new clothes. You know that story, right? Fake clothes, emperor's walking around, everything is visible. And the little boy says, actually, he's naked. And that's our job. Our job is to say, this is a racist prosecution. You have chosen to prosecute this young woman because she crossed gender lines that you think she's not supposed to. You think she's a, a, a whore, therefore she should die. You are doing this because of the race of the victim, because you consider the victim more important than other. You have to actually say this and litigate it and file motions and attach studies and do all these kinds of things, which, by the way, does not make you particularly popular because nobody likes to talk about it. I recall one time when we were fighting over whether or not, as I object all the time to this death qualification of jurors. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's important to know before the trial whether someone's in favor of the death penalty or not. My suggestion is that we pick extra alternates and at the end of the trial, if there's a conviction of first degree murder, we then question the jurors about the death penalty and if they are excludable for cause, we, pull, we can put, um, you know, extra alternates in, right? That's, that's what I think we should do. All studies have shown that death-qualified juries are more conviction-prone, are, are more likely to convict of higher offenses, and get the facts wrong. Because they're politically homogeneous. They don't argue with each other. And so they don't see things. And there's, there's nobody in your jury room saying, wait, 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 hang on a second, where's the physical evidence? Nobody is saying that, okay? And so you object to it, and then you talk about its racial exclusions. You talk about the higher proportion, and, and you just put it in the record. And um, you have to also put in the record like what race people are, and sometimes you have to ask them because it's not immediately apparent. 
Um, so when I, I was doing that in front of one judge, the judge said, you know, um, or trying to, the judge says, you know, it's obvious. You can look at anybody and tell what they are. And I said, well, judge, I don't know. You look white, but you might not be. <laughs> it was an interesting afternoon. Um, and so you want to think about what kind, how can we litigate this, okay? Can, how can we challenge the constitutionality of it? Can we talk about it being cruel and unusual and uh, not just because of, um, you know, violations of, of uh, equal protection, but cruel and unusual because it's arbitrary because we keep getting the wrong person, right? Can we talk about the jury selection that I've just talked about, how the prosecution uses their strikes, who the prosecutor um, uh, associates with, um, that the death penalty is a, process for, uh, is a proxy for race? Can we talk about um, how to create good voir dire conditions in which you can at least have an honest conversation about the issues that are in the case, which include race, okay? And that means that you have to be able to have good jury selection conditions, which mean talking to one person at a time and not groups. Can we do all of that? Can we litigate up, uh, all of that kind of stuff? Because you really cannot pretend that it's not a part of the case, that it's not a part of the trial, that it's not the reason that the prosecutor thinks this murder is worse than others. Okay? You're kidding yourself if you do that. I think it's really important also to understand that your job is to change the perspective of your audience, the judge, the jury, your client, your client's family, all of those people. And perspective is really how things are seen. The Texas Rangers wouldn't lie is a perspective, okay? And that's, in fact, what good movie makers do, right? They give you a perspective on the case, and you have a point of view. I, I've always personally wanted to have music during trials, but so far I've not been allowed to do it. I always thought music would be would really be a, a lovely thing to do. But let me give you an example of what I mean about changing perspective. For those of you who have tried cases, um, or perhaps just in your general conversation, did you ever know somebody who just has something they want to say and no matter what question you ask, that's the answer they give you? No? I'm the only one this has ever happened to? Well, I, I had a client who was charged, um, in, in, in my book I call him Richard Bowman, and he was charged with a double homicide. Um, he had a prior murder conviction, not a good fact, um, and uh, was a gang member, not a good fact. His title in the gang was enforcer, not a good fact. Um, <laughs> This was a, 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 a double homicide over drug turf, not a good fact. There were two eyewitnesses, which is one too many, and I never was exactly sure that my client had done it um, at all, uh, but the reason I was had my doubts was that if he had done it, there would have been no eyewitnesses, which I didn't think was a jury-friendly theory. Um, <laughs> there, there were a lot of problems. but. One of the things was in, in developing mitigation, by the way, I was about ready to jump up when you were talking about how um, your lawyer was talking to you about mitigation like during the trial. That is like way too late. You gotta be, you gotta be like working on both things right from the beginning. And um, so I wanted to put my client's sister on because my client's sister had two boys who Richard had really pushed away from the gangs and into a pretty good life, you know. But what she wanted to talk about was racism in the system and how he, you know, he was accountable for the first murder, but he was tried at 15 as an adult. He was put in an adult prison at 15. He was five foot nine, 127 pounds, and raped every day. They put him on a tier with lifers. So he learned to fight. And she wanted to talk about how that, that racist view that he was not salvageable at 15, and I, I was with her, you know? I'm like, Carolyn, I'm with you. I think it's great, but we can't actually talk about that because, like, you know, we have these white people on the jury, and um, I don't think that's going to go very well, and I need you to talk about the good things about your brother. I want the jury to know that his life has value, et cetera. And so I think we're in agreement. I put her on the stand at the penalty phase, and she starts talking about racism in the system anyway. You know, I ask her, do you love your brother? And that's what she starts talking about anyway. Um, 
And so the prosecution objects, the judge starts yelling at her, and I knew I was in trouble in this case anyway because first time I went in chambers, the judge had a larger than life bust of himself in chambers. <laughs> Things were not gonna go well. Um, and so the judge starts yelling at her, and Carolyn starts to cry. And she's crying, and my client, who I have not put on the stand for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is he's pretty deaf from having been locked up for so much, and so he shouts all the time, and every other word was MF, which was a verb, a noun, an adjective, and everything else. Um, he stands, and he says, Carolyn, please excuse my language, but this is what he said, fuck these honky motherfuckers. <laughs> Don't fucking beg for me, fuck all of them. I'm like... There has to be a way I can use this. <laughs> and that's when Carolyn did it for me. She turns to the jury and she says, you see, he'd rather die than see me hurt. And that's what this is about. That's what this costs. And that's why we shouldn't have a death penalty anymore. Thank you so much. So now we're into the interactive portion of our, of our program. And there are two mics um, on either side of the auditorium. And I want to invite those of you who have a question to ask our panel to line up behind them. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get it started by asking y'all, I know some of our panel is not from Georgia, but um, given the fact that we've had so many landmark death penalty decisions come out of Georgia, Furman, Greg, McCleskey, uh, Troy Davis, um, what does this say about Georgia's death penalty system? And um, how does this make Georgia appear to the rest of the country? Uh, I mean, you know, look, Georgia is the flagship for um, racist prosecutions. I mean, I, uh, they're not particularly subtle about it. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, the, the statistics were overwhelming in McCleskey. Um, in, in fact, the statistics were even worse than the ones uh, that you saw. I mean, in looking at them in the most um, uh, uh, conservative way, um, if the, the victim was white in Georgia, you are four times as likely to get the death penalty. If the victim is white and the defendant is not, you are 16 times as likely to get the death penalty, everything else being even, same criminal history, same kind of crime, same, all, everything else being even. Um, that's pretty bad even for government work. I see we have a question. Is somebody waiting to ask a question? Yes, uh, my name is Drew Stevens from 1L here at uh, Emory Law. Um, I've got a couple of questions, um, one for, for several different parties. Um, uh, Dr. Bacon, I was wondering if you could comment in your social science research on, I, I've seen a, a graphic, a map overlaying the use of the death penalty by the, a map of states, and it's used more predominantly in the South, as I recall, and that was overlaid um, right along the, the you know, lynching rates way long before. And I was wondering if you could comment on whether that was an accurate representation of what I saw. Um, Mr. Graves, I'm f from Texas and all I can, you know, ask is for your forgiveness for and, and your uh, courage and thanks for, for being here and what you're doing. Um, Ms. Professor Lyne, um, I want to thank you for your courage, but I was wondering if you could comment on um, what you think happened in Mr. Graves' case where they couldn't stop. Why, why couldn't they, I, I, I remember uh, Troy Davis's lawyer was here and he commented that he thought the prosecutor had a, made this a personal vendetta. Um, I was just curious if you could comment on what, if something gets out of control in a case. Um, and then a larger question that. Well, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> Go ahead. And, my, and then my final thought, and I'll sit down, <laughs> is uh, in order to abolish this, it has to come through the political channels. Correct. And so, I didn't know if y'all could come on, comment on how mobilizing as a political unit, because that's the only way it's gonna happen. 
and if you have any thoughts on that, but thank you. We just did it in Illinois, like less than a year ago. It can be done. Um, did you want to talk first? Yes. Yeah. Sure, so I'll um, address the question regarding the, um, the maps that you saw. It so sounds right <laughs> without being able to look at it. Um, there have been almost 1,300 executions in the country since the death penalty was reinstated. Um, and more than, or I think almost half of those come from Virginia and Texas alone. Um, so certainly some states are busier than others. And the South in general um, drives the numbers that we see in terms of, of um, sentences to death, but also actual executions. And the South, as we know, has a long history um, of using various forms of violence, legal and extra legal, to control um, marginalized populations. And so I think what you see there is a continuation of um, that form of social control, perhaps. Um, I realize we're not here to talk about the deterrence question, but I um, would be remiss if I don't point out that um, death penalty states have higher, across the board, have higher um, violent crime and murder rates than non-death penalty states, and I see a lot of of amens and, and head nodding in response to that. On the face of it, that doesn't mean that there's not a deterrent effect, but there are a lot of studies, a lot. Um, and if you stacked them up, the ones that suggest that there's a deterrent effect next to the ones that suggest that there is not, or even perhaps a brutalization effect of executions, you're gonna get equal weighted stacks. And so really what you see is a fight over statistical methods and measurement. And the answer on the deterrence question is we simply don't know. Um, so I just wanted to point that out regarding to the, the geographic distribution of the death penalty as well. So to answer your two other questions, in terms of stopping things, one of the hard things about being a good prosecutor, um, and we need good prosecutors, is that we ask them to do two different things. We ask them to do justice, and we reward, but we reward them for winning. And ego is a big thing. Um, you know, you have to have a strong ego to do trial work. I mean. I have something of one I like to think it's, I hope it's a reasonable balance between ego and idealism here. Uh, but I, I um, you know, I mean, I stand between my client and the United States government or the state of Michigan or state of Illinois, and I tell them, you can't have my guy because I said so. Um, you know, you, you, so, and, and that can take over. And so the desire to win and the fact that this prosecutor would tell a witness, I don't want to hear that, um, is because the desire to win overtook it. In terms of your question about the political process, um, at a certain point, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a legal doctrine called evolving standards of decency, which is how we uh, outlaw the execution of, the, of mental retarded people and of juveniles, finally. Um, and if we see enough states, you know, uh, Illinois was the 16th state, which is the most states without the death penalty, um, you know, as far as I know ever. And if we see enough states, and there are states like Maryland and Montana and Connecticut and other states that are, are ready to abolish a death penalty, at a certain point we should hit that evolving standards of decency moment where it might be possible to persuade the United States Supreme Court, now I realize who's on it, but it might be possible to persuade them that it's time to um, understand that we can no longer tinker with the machinery of death. And I would just add that for those of us here in Georgia um, that want to get involved in this, a big thing that we can do is support funding of our public defender system and of our capital defenders. Um, for years, we've, had, we've put more and more people on death row. Um, the Capital Defender Office has been around since 2005, and they're doing really incredible work representing people facing the death penalty and resolving many, many, many cases with life sentence instead of death. In fact, we've gone for the last two years with only one new death sentence in Georgia. So while we're absolutely still executing people and we need to struggle against that, um, the, the, the increase of, of our population on death row is decreasing, and that's directly related to our capital defenders having the resources that they need to do their job to, to do exactly what Professor Lyon is talking about and convince juries to, to see things differently. Uh, when we think of having children, uh, we think of all of the things we want to give to our children, to have them feel loved and be nurtured, etc. Uh, and when those children are deprived of that and become adults and enter the system as uh, defendants in the capital system, we often find jurors pushing back against that. That's, 
the abuse excuse as it's been named. I was wondering how you square with first saying that the most heinous crimes are, you know, deserve the death penalty because ostensibly those would be the people who are most impacted by this lack of nurturing, et cetera. And secondly, how you bring a juror to understand that. Um, I wrestle with that a lot. And in most of those death penalty cases that we reviewed, um, I was struck by several things. One, um, often the, de the degree to which defense neglected to do sufficient research on mitigating factors and investigate things that could be presented to the jury um, that might conceivably sway them toward um, away from a death sentence. We did see, and, I, and I'm speaking to this sort of more from personal impressions and a systematic um, analysis of our data, um, we did see a good amount of pushback of exactly what you're talking about, of rejecting that abuse excuse. And then in other, um, in other instances, it, it appeared to be effective, but it was so random. I mean, I come back to this, this notion of arbitrary and capricious and the extent to which sometimes that mattered and sometimes it didn't. And you're right that, you know, at some point, you know, we, have, we hold adults in our system, for all offenses, accountable. The, the, the criminal justice system is meant to be about individual accountability um, and answering for one's offenses. But at what point is the system accountable to those individuals 10, 20 years earlier? Um, it's not the criminal justice system, but it's still a system that plays a role in, in you know, um, depriving a person of that nurturing that you're talking about. So I think we need to think about system accountability as well as individual accountability. In, in terms of how you try to, to bridge that gap with a jury, um, you, you have to find the places in which the jury can identify with you. And, you know, one of the questions that I, I sometimes ask of jurors is, um, if they have children, is do they care who their children hang out with? And everybody says yes, and then I ask them why, and they say, well, because if they hang out with the wrong kind of person, they might get in trouble. And, you know, and, and, but getting them to understand that there's no one else to hang out with but the wrong kind of person, you know, at 63rd and Langley, um, you know, is, is, a, is a very tough thing. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, there are cases at either end um, of the spectrum, right? Cases that are so bad that if you're in favor of the death penalty, you know, uh, Timothy McVeigh is an example people often use, right? Um, in cases that where there's so much mitigation, you know, the battered wife who, you know, who, who finally kills her batterer in his sleep, you know, where pretty much nobody would give, you know, there's, there's like that at either end. But most cases are in that middle category, right? I mean, there's no such thing as a good murder, um, but they're not like at either end of the spectrum. And when I ran the Death Penalty Resource Center, we represented all the death row inmates in the state of Illinois. And I would look at these cases and I couldn't understand how some of these defendants ended up with the death penalty. Um, I mean, once we began to look into it, we saw why, but um, because they had, and here's the, the, the sad truth. The single, besides race, the second most important thing is, who is your lawyer? If you have a good lawyer, who will do whatever, and you know, I, I've gone and 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 into graveyards to try to find names of people to to uh, f to find the family of of my client. I mean, who will do whatever they need to do to try to save their client's life? You will live, and if not, you will die. You cannot sell what you would not buy. If it does not matter to you, everybody in the room knows it, and that means you have to find a way personally to connect to your client, your client's family, and to his story, you know, and you have to figure out a way to tell the story in a way that has a universal appeal. Um, and so when people hear the word abuse excuse, it's because someone will say, well, he grew up in poverty and he was abused as a child. But that's very different than the following. When, when this young man, when Alton was little, when he was born, his mother threw him in the garbage. He, the reason he knew this is that his grandmother, who was 35, fished him out of the garbage. And she would tell him about it, that he was in the garbage. And they used to call him, again, pardon my language, pissy shit, because nobody would change him. 
When he got to school, um, he acted out. He was in trouble in school a lot. And when he was seven or eight years old, he was really getting into trouble. And one day he was in class and he wouldn't sit down. And his teacher you know, went over and just kind of put her hand on his shoulder and said, sit down, and pushed him into the chair. And he jumped up screaming because there was a pool of blood in the bottom of the chair because his family had been selling him for sex at eight. And you know what the school did? They gave him an ice pack and sent him home. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not an abuse excuse. Beth? Hi, I'm Beth Comp. I'm an attorney with the Southern Center, a colleague of Sarah's. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful program. I've got a couple of quick questions. Um, first, I'm just curious as to your thoughts on life without parole as an alternative to the death penalty. I'll leave that open. Um, second, my memory of reading McCleskey from law school is that what the justices kind of said is there may be all this statistical evidence, but we can't let that color our decision in this case of this crime and this defendant. And I feel like that it can sort of be analogized to the broader debate on the death penalty where we have so much evidence and so many statistics of how racially disparate it is and the sort of different ways that it's that. But one gruesome case can be, can sort of keep people on that track of like, no, but wait, there are some crime, there are some crimes that are so bad that this needs to happen. And then they don't get to like your second question of like, is our machinery actually adequate to do this? Um, like you may know in Connecticut, they were really close to banning the death penalty and then this like horribly gruesome murder happened and then now those guys are on death row and blah, blah, blah. But, but I'm, my question is just sort of how do, you, how do we make that leap in discourse from an individual terrible crime that nobody wants to contemplate and yet broader, more mundane injustices? Well, it, it's kind of a, a, a big question, but a big part of the problem with the, that we have right now has to do with something called television. Um, and, you know, crime, violent crime has gone down in the last 15 years by about 30 percent, but crime reporting has gone up 600 percent in the same period of time. It's cheap entertainment. You know, you, you, you can videotape the billionth trial in Florida, which seems to be like the favorite place for strange crimes to occur. Um, but, you know, and you can have people who know nothing making comments about it um, and disparaging generally the defense. And it's a cheap way to entertain people. And the simple story is easier to tell. There was a crime. It was bad. The person who did it was bad. You know, we should rid ourselves of bad people. Um, and that's an easier story to tell. It takes a few more seconds to tell a more nuanced story about how it is that we have crime and, and how racialized our society is. Um, we have police officers in inner city schools and in, uh, in minority primary schools, and when there's a fist fight, they send these young children to jail instead of like, to detention. <laughs> you know, if you break a window, you go to jail for criminal damage to property as a juvenile. And once you're, you start down that path, which is one of the things, you know, one of my problems with some of the studies is that they say, well, we want to look at, you know, at the criminal history, you know, and he's, he had this when he was 14, and this when he was 16, and this when he was 18, but he had this when he was 14 because we didn't treat him the way we would treat, you know, a kid in, well, I don't know what the equivalent here is in Land Decatur. Is Decatur really white? No. No? I mean, I don't know. There, there, I mean, there's, you know, uh, I mean, we, you know, we, that kid who broke a window would have to go, like, you know, mow the lawn and pay for the window and apologize to the person whose window they broke. That's, and that's, you know, a different approach. And so there's, there's a whole lot of things in your question that are, are hard to answer in a, in a succinct way. But one of the things that we have to do 
So we have good stories and we need to tell them. We need to not just talk to ourselves, you know, we need to talk to other people. It's why I've started publishing in Huffington and, you know, getting yelled at for the things I say, but whatever, you know. We, we need to do that more because um, otherwise the entire conversation is dominated by people who don't even know how many countries there are in Africa. They think Africa's one country and they're running for president. <laughs> Um, Mr. Graves, do you want to respond to the life without parole question? Well, I, I think life without parole is just another form of the death penalty. You know. I, I, I lived among guys who would rather have the death penalty than have a life sentence. Because when they had the death penalty, they still had a fighting chance. But when they get life without parole, it's over. The rest of their natural life, they're right there. So it's, it's just another form of the death penalty. And you, you, you can ask any guy on death row, would you prefer to have a life sentence over the death penalty? A life without parole over death sentence? And they'll tell you it's death sentence because if I have a death sentence, I have a fighting chance. You know, if I lose, I die. If I win, I go home. But when I get a, a life without parole, it's over. So I, I don't agree with the life without parole. I just think it's just, it's just another way of saying we're going to kill you. We're just not going to put the needle in your arm. Back here. My name is Joanne Weiss, and I'm just very interested in questions of the death penalty and also interested in questions of immigration and immigration justice and how all that kind of meshes together. And uh, so my question is really for Dr. Bacon, who is, seems to be the data guru. <laughs> and that is whether or not, I understand that the single most determining factor of whether or not a defendant gets the death penalty is the race of the victim. I'm wondering how that breaks down in terms of other races other than black, how it breaks down in terms of Hispanic versus you know, a white victim or whatever. Are there data that talk about that, that show that, where the, where the body of evidence is on that particular case, or that issue? There are data on, on that issue, and, um, you know, frequently we speak in terms of, um, you know, you, you've noticed I talk about victims as uh, white or non-white, which is a very blunt and sort of um, ignorant in many ways um, way to talk about victims, but frequently what we see is um, Hispanics are usually, that's the, usually the next, um, in terms of size, population where, you know, as you say, I, I speak in data and statistics and the big picture, um, and so we, we think in terms of having sufficient statistical power and all this type of stuff. Um, and usually what we see is a similar trend. Um, it's highly place-specific because um, you know, the, the populations, um, you know, even just in certain parts of Atlanta, the, the most sizable minority population is different in different sections. And a lot of, this, a lot of these race effects have to do with um, what is the minority population in relation to the majority population. So you're gonna find a lot of differences jurisdiction to jurisdiction. California and Texas in particular are gonna look a little different, for example, than Virginia or, um, or Georgia or Florida. Well, Florida might more closely resemble Texas. Um, but yes, the, the, I think, short answer to what I think is your question is that we see, um, we see race effects for the victim, um, uh, any non-white victim, um, you're gonna have less of a chance of the death penalty being pursued and ultimately implemented. Um, again, the race effects are a little different for defendants because it, those effects don't kick in until you look at the dyads um, with the victim. So there's no direct effect in our study um, and in many of this, the other studies, the Baldus study, um, there's no direct race effect of the defendant to start with. I'm Marjorie Timmer, and um, you're about to find out I am not an attorney or a student in a law. And this may be a little bit of a tangential question, but um, uh, we have a, you know, a, a flawed judicial system which um, found you guilty of a crime that you, you did not commit and imprisoned you on death row and the Innocence Project has um, freed a number of people as well. 
In, in, in your case, sir, it was, there was prosecutorial um, malfeasance. And part of my question is, I don't know how common that is. Very common. Is, is, there, any, is there any way of holding these people, you know, that particular prosecutor accountable for that behavior? And is that something that has occurred in other cases? And if so, I mean, what, what, how are these people held accountable? Well, the guy that did this to me has not lost one night of sleep in his own bed. So that means that, yeah, we definitely have a problem with our system. Uh, that's nothing really on the books, and particularly in Texas, that holds them accountable, it's, which is why he didn't have no problem doing it. You know, he wasn't going to be held accountable. I mean, it's in black and white now what he did to me, and yet I can't go and we, they can't prosecute him can't because he was immunity. He's immune to the United States Supreme Court um, held last year that um, you can't sue a prosecutor's office uh, for malfeasance like this. Um, they are absolutely immune from being sued even civilly. Um, it's a very, very big problem, and it has to do, like I say, with the, the desire to win overcoming ethical constraints um, is part of it, but also because there's no price to pay. Actually, um, just recently in Texas, a court of inquiry has been open to take a look at another prosecutor in another Texas exoneration case, which is the first time I've heard of such a thing in Texas ever. Um, but almost nothing ever happens and the bar does nothing. And part of it has to do with if you read a, an appellate opinion where they find prosecutorial misconduct, you, you know, like hiding of, of exculpatory evidence, which um, in, in, my, in my years with the Death Penalty Resource Center, I did not have a single case where, that we investigated where we could not prove subordination of perjury at least with one person all of them, even cases where the evidence was overwhelming of guilt, you know, a guy was like driving down the street with the brain matter of his victim on him, you know, I mean, they didn't need to suborn perjury, but they did. And it, it's, it, and one of the things is when this happens is that if there's a reversal by the court, they say the prosecutor erred when, or it was, you know, error when the prosecutor did not turn over X or Y. They don't say Mr. Jones, they don't name him. There's no personal cost to it. Uh, I, I was trying a case at, at, where I was representing an innocent guy, which, by the way, I really hate innocent clients. No offense, but they're so hard to, you know, it, everybody presumes guilt, and it just innocent clients drive me crazy. Give me a guilty guy with a reasonable defense any day. But um, anyway, it was, an, it was an ID case, and, um, it, and the, the question was whether they picked out the right guy or not. And in our law, you can never comment on a defendant's right to remain silent. So if the defendant doesn't take the stand, you can't say anything about it. Or if he was arrested by the police, and he, because it's part of our law that you have an absolute right to that. And it's been the part of the law, like black letter law since 1964. And I'm trying this case, and we... You know, I say in my opening statement that, you know, Mr. Frias said he, he isn't guilty when he pleads not guilty, he's the wrong man, you know, the real man's still running, that kind of opening statement. And um, Mike Morrissey and I tried the case together, and between us, we pretty much annihilated their case, you know, pretty well, because, um, you know, the guy got taller, he got shorter, he got fatter, he got, you know, I mean, all the things that happen when, when you have a bad ID. And uh, so um, during closing argument, the prosecutor gets up and says, you know, she says he's, you know, saying he's not the man when he pleads not guilty. Well, he walks over to the witness stand, points at it, and says, the you didn't hear from the defendant in this case saying that. Okay? I mean, it, uh, it's hard to explain how bad that is if you're not, if you don't do this work, but that's pretty bad. So the jury goes out, and I go over to him. I said, Ken, what the, were you thinking, you know, when you did this? And he said, this is what he said. He said, you did too well in the trial. And I figured it'll get reversed, but I'll keep a bad guy off the street for a few years, probably four. And he called it exactly right. It took me four years to get him out. And he felt fine about that. I mean, he, he deliberately chose, and would you like to know what his job is now? Judge. Roberto. Uh, good evening. My name is Roberto Gutierrez. Um, 
I got a little mix of a question and a comment, and I don't even know how I'm gonna frame this, so hopefully, I'm not a lawyer, please excuse me if I have something. Uh, my perception of the judicial system is, um, kind of pushes you to accept that you are guilty as a way to better call you a deal rather than challenge whatever you being whatever charge you being accused of. So I'm guessing when you don't have that much resources to let's say afford a good lawyer or a lawyer in general, people feel quite tempted to you know what, let's call the deal because it's better than try to challenge it because then they throw the whole book at me or whoever. So I guess my question is under that circumstances, is there any immediate immediate option that we should try to seek for the system, or is there any other immediate alternative that we try to like, pursue on a system that pretty much push the people with no resources to accept whatever whatever they give you as a way to cut a better deal? Well, I mean, there is a big pressure, economic and otherwise, um, to plead cases, and you know, sometimes you have a client who should plead because uh, like he's guilty and um, also they have the evidence okay um, so I'm not arguing that pleading guilty is 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 a bad idea but I do think that people do plead guilty when they do a cost-benefit analysis essentially where they what they're saying is you know your lawyer says look here's what you're risking you're risking 20 years you're risking life you're risking whatever and they're offering this which isn't great but it's, you know, it's better than taking this risk, and then the defendant makes a choice. If, you're, if you have a good lawyer, the lawyer has done the work, and when, you know, when I'm having this conversation with my client, my client knows what's out there, knows what the risks are, and um, I'm gonna respect what my client wants to do, you know, because it's his case, not mine. I can't say that that's true of all criminal defense lawyers, and in public defender's offices, you know, when I was in the felony trial court in, in the public defender's office in Chicago, I had 220 felonies at any given time. That's a lot of cases, and I know I, I worked all the time, I worked hard, but I can promise you that there are cases I did not do the work on that they deserved, um, and that may have taken pleas out of fear. Um, and the only way to change that would be to pour a lot more resources into the pretrial and trial end of things, which nobody's willing to do. Um, we could also criminalize less things, like drugs. If I could add to that too. Um, I, I think you raise a really important point, and I think it's actually related to your point um, with some of the pitfalls of the immense degree of prosecutorial discretion that exists in the system and the charging and the decision making. Um, and, and you heard some of the numbers I presented in our flow from the 6,000 cases to those that ultimately ended up under sentence of death. There were over 350 um, that were originally filed for a death notice, but 140 of those were withdrawn. Now, not all 140 of those were meant to elicit a plea. Sometimes they were withdrawn because the subsequent realization of insufficient evidence, et cetera. Um, or a subsequent realization that the person was in fact not guilty. But often what we saw in the, the documents that we reviewed was that a death notice would be filed as a means to elicit a plea, um, which is coercive at best. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, I think the answer is to pour a lot more resources. And, and we all know those are, we're quite short on those these days. But so I don't, I, I don't have anything too optimistic to offer you, but I do think that you've highlighted one of the fundamental issues in terms of the challenges that we face. And to add to that, man, I, what you're saying, I'm going to tell you this. When you're arrested, the first thing you do is ask for a lawyer. Because once you ask for a lawyer, they're not supposed to interrogate you any longer without your attorney. That's what you ask. I'm going to tell you, anytime you're arrested and they want to talk to you, ask for a lawyer. That's it. So I am seeing one question over here and three over here, and we're going to have to cut it off after these ones, and I'm going to ask y'all to ask your questions in as succinct a way as you can, so everybody has time <laughs> so to nice get them in. <laughs> um, we'll start over here. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my question to the panel is this. Given the parameters of what you spoke about with the judges in your case about losing 100% of the motions, uh, the prosecutorial misconduct in the courtroom and things of that nature. Are you aware of any push uh, within any state that you've worked in 
to make people more aware of who their judges are, especially on the state level when there are elections. I think if, if light was shined on the fact that judicial selection across the country and appointment uh, on the federal level is, is a part of the bigger problem with cookie cutter uh, prosecutors becoming judges, and then that only adds a, another layer that you have to conquer as a working attorney, uh, a defense attorney. So that, that's my question. Um, well, actually, it's a very important question right now. In fact, um, uh, what we've been seeing is a lot of money being poured into judicial elections by uh, right-wing organizations who use criminal law as a proxy um, because what they really want is money. Um, and so, for example, um, the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court had to fight back uh, against a retention uh, battle where people who wanted to see malpractice caps and didn't like his vote on that pretended that they were after him for criminal justice issues and hired actors to say things like, um, you know, my name is Joe Jones and I rape five-year-olds, but Justice Kilbride was on my side. You know, which ac what actually what he voted, he said was, you know, you have to give an instruction about reasonable doubt, you know? Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're seeing a lot of the politicization and polarization on the bench that we're seeing elsewhere. Um, Appointments are not ideal, but they're a lot better than elections because if a judge has to run for election, that means he has to campaign or she has to campaign, and they have to raise money, and they have to, and, and you know, all the things that go along with that. Um, and so there are a, a lot of movements right now, and there, in fact, um, former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has a big um, website about judicial independence to try to take elections out of judges, out of, um, you know, for the judiciary to get rid of them, um, which I think w would also help. It also helps though, um, sometimes when I would be trying cases and I'd be at like the Illinois Coalition Abolish the Death Penalty, they, people wanna help and they, they don't know how to help and I'd say, come to court and take notes. Hmm. You have no idea what, you know, I, I don't know about deterrent effect for crime, but I do know about deterrent effect for elected officials. And if they think that somebody is there paying attention to the things that they're saying, because eventually the bailiff, you know, slides over and says, uh, so who are you? And I'm just an interested citizen to see how people are treated in this courtroom. Man, uh, people clean up their act. So, um, I mean, that's, if, if you're looking, if those of you who are thinking activists, you know, things that you can do, that's something that you can, that you can do. Peggy? Uh, yes, the, the statement that was made about half the people on death row in Alabama there because the judge overruled life sentences of the jury, is, is that still the law? Is that? Yes. That's been ruled constitutional? It has in Harris versus Alabama. Um, there are, are really three states that do this, Florida, Indiana, and um, Alabama, but, but Florida and Indiana, for a judge to overrule a judge, judge's uh, jury's decision, they have to give reasons why the jury's decision was wrong. They have to justify it legally, and, and at least. In the Alabama statute, they don't have to do any of that, and the mm. Supreme Court said that's fine. Thank you. Back over here. Graves, at any point in your entire ordeal, did you ever lose hope? And if not, how did you maintain any semblance? I, I never lost hope. And I never lost hope because I was innocent. Uh, and I was still naive in thinking that it was gonna all work out because I still wanted to believe my system. I grew up in this country and as bad as I was being treated, I still wanted to believe that our system would work. I needed it to work. Otherwise, they were gonna execute me. So I couldn't afford to give up hope. Max? Um, short of uh, abolition, I wanted to think, uh, ask you about tinkering mechanisms that might make it a little uh, rarer, a little fairer, and two that i just thinking about is um, Georgia has a proportionality review. I wonder if other states have that and ways in which that might be made more effective. Um, and then the other one is uh, when the feds reimpose the death penalty, I think they, they require a panel of people to make a decision, a panel of three, I think, from different parts of the, of the 
federal system, and um, I'm wondering if anybody is thinking about doing that within a state. So maybe three prosecutors would have to come together and make a decision so it wouldn't just be in a state like Georgia where the DA can make the decision. It wouldn't be with one DA alone. Regarding proportionality, the problem with the, Georgia's proportionality review and is that it only requires that they look at other death sentences. And the big place where the dis disparity is is in the charging decisions and in, you know and all the way down the line. And so to do a good proportionality review would require looking at 6,000 cases, um, and nobody wants to wants to do that. There are some states other than Georgia that do require it. Washington State requires it. Um, but it doesn't actually seem to mean very much because they've affirmed some death sentences even though the Green River killer who killed 49 people did not get the death penalty. It's hard to imagine what would be proportional to that. You know, so, I mean, it's, I don't know how much meaning it, it actually has. Um, and your second question, I'm sorry. Federal cases. The, 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 the federal system has, has a mechanism by which you can try to talk the prosecution out of, the, of seeking the death penalty early on. And this, is, um, this tends to, to have some positive effect. That is, yeah, I've done like four death cases, uh, federal death cases, and only one of them I stayed authorized I had to try. The other three I was able to get deauthorized. And the way that you do that is that they appoint someone to, to do the death penalty investigation, to do the mitigation investigation early, and then you have the opportunity to make a presentation to your local prosecutor and then to the U.S. Attorney's uh, Committee, um, which um, call themselves the, the death squad. Really? Like, I, one of the guys gave me a card, and that's what it said on it. It's kind of... Um, this was not under Holder. This was this was under under Ashcroft. So maybe that's changed. But um, anyway, um, but at least it gives the opportunity for there to be some reasoned discussion as to whether seeking the death penalty is appropriate in a particular case or not. That being said, um, the federal system is even worse in terms of its racialized imposition of the death penalty than states. Um, I think it's 71 or 72 percent of the people, um, uh, uh, this is about six years ago, on the federal death row were people of color, which is very, very high. And in the military system, it's 75 percent of the people who get the death penalty in the military system are people of color. So I don't know that it solves the race problem, but it at least gives an opportunity to try to take it off that track. I agree on the, the statement of regarding proportionality reviews. They're typically a very well-intentioned um, endeavor, but when done properly, they usually reveal that there isn't any proportionality. Um, so there's uh, a fair amount of resistance to, to actually conducting them properly, which is really the linchpin with, with proportionality reviews. Um, and as to your second question, Mitt Romney, when he was governor, Romney actually proposed um, what he thought was sort of the gold standard of, or what could be the gold standard of death penalty statutes to reinstate capital punishment. And that was among his ideas, among his suggestions, was that the char initial charging decision be made by a panel, uh, which potentially, if it were implemented, I think could have some mitigating impact, but um, not a panacea. So just in our last literally three minutes, I'm going to ask each of our panelists, I'm going to give you a minute or less to offer a, fi a final thought and um, offer any uh, websites if folks uh, in the audience want to go for, for additional information. Dr. Bacon? I wasn't prepared for this one. Um, well, I want to thank you all for a great conversation. Um, I, I think that a lot of really important considerations have been brought to light tonight. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I opened with it, so I'll close with it. I think, the, to me, the most important um, consideration is the fact that no matter how you cut it, no matter which state you're looking in, um, and no matter how you're measuring the various outcomes and steps in the process, the issue of race is present on the scales of justice. And if you're okay with that, um, well, I, I just can't imagine being okay with that. Um, and I've thought about this, you know, I think you have many, many years of thinking about this um, on this panel, and I don't see a way to fix it. 
other than to do away with capital punishment. Um, I find, particularly when I was teaching, that um, people typically respond, if you're trying to convince someone who supports capital punishment, um, trying to reveal the error of their ways and, and point them in the right direction, um, it's very hard. <laughs> people, people tend to be very emotional and, um, you know, people, for example, will cite deterrence as their reason for supporting the death penalty. And then when you show them that there's no conclusive evidence that deterrence works, they go, well, I support it anyway. Um, so it tends to come from more of a retribution standpoint. But I find information is the most powerful thing to engage in conversations. And I think the Death Penalty Information Center is one of the easiest and most accessible online resources that gives very just sort of straightforward, um, plain facts about capital punishment on every aspect of it. And I think that that's some of the best um, accessible information to equip yourselves with um, fodder for those conversations. Thanks. And that's deathpenaltyinfo.org. Right. Mr. Graves. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me. Uh, you know, it's been 15 months since I've been released. And it, it's, been, uh, it's been crazy because I made up my mind before I got out that once I got out, not if, but once I got out, I would spend the rest of my life trying to educate people about this, this beast known as the death penalty that threatens all of us, not just me, but all of us. See, I was at home minding my own business, and I ended up on death row. So that says we got a problem, you know, and uh, I was... I have an insight that others may not have because I was down there. This is personal for me. I was down there. I met guys who would give you the shirt off their back, but they made one mistake, and their life been summed up to that one mistake, and the states they killed them. They're human beings, and I'm saying to you that the state that you're live in, living in that has the death penalty is killing people in your name. What are you going to do about it? I say stand up and say, enough killing in my name. Because we're not getting it right. We're, not gonna, we're never going to get it right. Because as I said earlier, we make mistakes. And I just say that if you want to get involved, want to know more, like she said, educate yourself. I always tell people, educate yourself about the death penalty and you'll know what to do. Thank you. Well, um... One minute or less, hmm. <laughs> I, I think that what I would like to be able to say one day, I would like to be able to go to that career day and not have the answer to the question be, what color is the victim? I, I, would, I would really like that to be true one day. But um, there's a lot of you know, young people here, and... Um, you know, please learn these stories, tell these stories, fight these battles, even if you don't win them, even when you lose motions, you know. Uh, I mean, my favorite compliment from a client ever was, you know, Miss Lyon, you can really take a punch. Um, <laughs> it's, it's worth fighting them. It's worth speaking them because slowly we are changing people's minds. And I, I... You never lost hope. I've never lost hope either, and I'm never going to change, and I bet you aren't either. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you want to get involved here in Georgia, please check out our coalition, Georgians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. It's gfadp.org. If you'd like to learn more about the Southern Center for Human Rights, it's schr.org. Both organizations are very active in social media. If Facebook or Twitter are your thing, please rebroadcast our messages. Um, thanks again to Emery for hosting. Thank you, Judge Jones. Thank you, Terika, for all your work in organizing this. And thanks, y'all, for having a great evening with us. Oh, and thank the panelists, of course. <laughs>